So I was just in the shower and I was washing my hair and it got me thinking about bacteria. Your body is absolutely covered in bacteria and they're there to eat the sweat and the oils that come out of your sudoriferous and sebaceous glands which cover your entire body. Now that's a problem because even though these things don't smell like anything on their own, bacteria poop does. So they eat these things, they poop out stinks, and different species of bacteria living in different parts of your body produce different stinks, and that's why armpit sweat and butt sweat and foot sweat all smell so different. So what can we do? We need to wash off the poop, but we need to keep those oils on our skin because they keep our hair looking nice and healthy and our skin looking nice and healthy. So we use things like conditioner and lotion. These are full of plant-based oils that these bacteria haven't evolved to be able to eat. So with the magic of biology, we are able to smell good and look good at the same time. And that is just so freaking cool to me. Every time I eat yogurt, it reminds me of some really common, confusing vocab that a lot of people have problems with. So I'm going to help clear it up for everybody really quick. Probiotics are good bacteria. They're bacteria that help your guts do what they need to do. So you want those. Probiotics. You can think like prokaryote, like bacteria or prokaryote. So probiotics are good bacteria, you find them in yogurt. And don't buy into the marketing crap. You get them out of like Walmart great value brand yogurt, just as much as the $15 stuff. Antibiotics kill bacteria. Antibiotics, so you can think anti against those destroy the bacteria in your body. They don't work on viruses, they only kill bacteria. And then you've got prebiotics, which are the things that feed the good bacteria. Prebiotics are things that you can't digest but these bacteria can. So if you've taken antibiotics, make sure to eat some probiotics and then lots of prebiotics to keep them healthy. Hope that helps. Artificial sweeteners are designed to be hundreds of times sweeter than things like cane sugar or corn syrup. And that makes sense because having it be so much sweeter means that the company doesn't have to use as much and that saves them money. But it also makes some fun and observable effects on the products that they produce. For example, this Coca-Cola has about 50 grams of sugar dissolved into it, whereas this Diet Coke only has a few milligrams of aspartame to achieve a similar level of sweetness. And that difference in dissolved solids means that even though these two cans have the exact same volume, they have vastly different densities. And you can prove it by putting them in water and seeing this regular Coke sink and this Diet Coke will float. Just one more thing to love about science. You can find it absolutely anywhere you look. Check me out, I'm all beefy. <laughs> this comment has such a cool story behind it, I just wanted to share it with everybody. You see, the phrase Eureka, being associated with scientific discovery, goes all the way back to ancient Greece, when Archimedes was trying to sort out the major mathematical conundrum of his time, which was how to measure the internal volume of an irregularly shaped object without first having to measure every single side and edge and angle and curve and point and put all these different things together and it would just be a nightmare. So one night, he's getting in the bath and he notices that the bath water is being displaced the more of his body goes into it. And the legend goes that he immediately realized that the volume of the water being displaced must be the same as the volume of his body. And that if he wanted to measure the internal volume of any object, no matter what the dimensions are, all he had to do was submerge it in water and the volume of water being displaced would be the same as the volume of that object. And he was so excited by this discovery that he leapt up out of the bath and went running through the streets of Syracuse stark naked yelling, Eureka! Which is Greek for, I found it. The word Eureka is also very similar to the word heuristic, which refers to all the mental pathways that we build throughout our lives, our biases, our learned experiences, all the things that help us sort through situations very quickly. So I always say that if you can get outside of your own heuristics, you might just discover something new and find yourself yelling, Eureka! Do it with clothes on, though. This is a cool question. The average Homo erectus brain was around 30% smaller than the average human brain. However, the total standard distribution of human brain size does overlap with theirs. So like the smaller end of the human brains today are around the average size brain for them. So they almost certainly spoke. They had fire, they had material culture, they had community and society. As far as our complex languages, it's a maybe, but I'm leaning more towards the yes side myself. Also, Homo erectus didn't have the same head shape as us. They didn't have a forehead. It would have gone from their eyebrows and then just like burp straight back. And they had a little projection off the backside here to accommodate for that. So they would have looked different, but not that different. They ranged around the mid five feet. The tallest ones that we know of, like the ones around Lake Turkana, were almost my height. 
So they probably would have coexisted with us pretty reasonably. And I can say that with some confidence because they did coexist with us for almost 100,000 years. So maybe, yeah. This is a super fun question that I could easily talk about for over an hour, but here's a couple things to think about. First of all, evolution is all about selection pressure. If you do this thing, you'll die. If you don't do this thing, you'll die. This is what drives evolutionary change. But the past 12,000 years of human history have been all about removing as much of that selection pressure as possible. We live in houses. We have indoor plumbing. You can go outside and not get eaten by a lion. These things are freeing up our genes to kind of drift and flow a little bit differently than before. And we see certain trends as a result, like how our heads are getting bigger and bigger as a result of modern medicine. We can do cesarean sections now, so you don't have to worry about fitting this watermelon out of your birth canal. Also, we're seeing humans getting taller and taller because we have access to better nutrition and we're not relying on hunting and gathering and worrying about famines anymore. I mean, just look at me. I'm six foot two and you could land an aircraft on my forehead. The thing is, evolution isn't a ladder. We can't just look up to the next rung and see what's going to happen. But looking at these trends really starts to get the imagination going. Anyone who's ever even heard of evolution before has almost certainly seen a diagram like this one, where you have some sort of monkey that just levels up into a human. As someone who studies evolution for a living, I hate diagrams like this. They are the worst. Let's go over several reasons why. First of all, this type of diagram was first developed back in the 1960s by a guy by the name of Rudolf Zallinger. It was meant for popular science writing, just to sort of give people a general idea of what scientists were actually saying. This was not meant to be anything actually educational. And yet, it is used in educational publications all the time. And that's really dumb, because it promotes orthogenesis. This promotes the idea that humans evolved on purpose, that there's some sort of grand goal for evolution, that evolution is some sort of ladder with a top rung up here that is humans, and that all the other apes are just kind of waiting in line hoping to become human someday. That makes no sense. None of that is how anything works. Also, this type of misinformation breeds more misinformation. Because I get asked all the time, well, if this thing's still alive, and this thing's still alive, where's all the stuff in the middle? This thing isn't alive. They made it look like something that you can recognize to kind of help you understand it, and they've actually hurt you. Because this isn't alive. Whatever this is supposed to represent, Sacalanthropus, Orin, or whatever, that's also dead. All of these are dead except for this thing, and there's also like 10,000 steps in the middle that they didn't include, and there's also things that broke off, and there's also things that broke off and then came back, and they just decided not to put any of that in there because they wanted to make it look like it was something purposeful and intentional when it's not. And the biggest problem about this is that this kind of nonsense breeds distrust about evolution. Because people look at this and they say, I didn't come from this chimpanzee or spider monkey or whatever they put in the background here. And you're right, because chimpanzees and spider monkeys and all that stuff, they're actually up here on the front with us. They came from this thing too, and they have a different trajectory with all sorts of other steps and all sorts of other branching and ramifications and all that you're not seeing because they just left it off because they wanted it to be human focused. Saying that this is how evolution works is like saying World War II was a serious disagreement. It leaves so much out that it's not even useless anymore. It's actually harmful. So if you ever see something like this in one of your textbooks or something, call your local evolutionary biologist so that we can scream about it because nobody deserves to have to suffer through this. Ever since I posted that video about the Zallinger diagram and how much I hate it, so many of you have asked for a better diagram, one that actually shows what we know about human evolution. And I have that diagram for you right here. This diagram covers six different genera across seven million years. So you can see each of these horizontal lines is a million years, seven, six, five, four, all the way up to zero. So this is the modern era up here. It's also got these long vertical boxes. Each one of these boxes is a different species, and I've color coded them based on genus as well. The length of the boxes tells you how long this species existed, or at least how long we have them in the fossil record. So, for example, here's Homo erectus. We see them pop up in the fossil record around 1.9 million years ago, and they disappear around 110,000 years ago. Could they have lived earlier than that? Could they have lasted longer than that? Absolutely. But we don't have any fossil to prove that. So, right now, this is the map that we've got. Just imagine the edges of all these boxes are just a little bit fuzzy. 
So here you've got Sacalanthropus, Ororin, these are the Artipithecines, these are the Australopithecines, these are the Paranthropines, and then over here, everything in red is the hominins, that's our genus, and here we are on top right there, Homo sapiens, we are the only ones left. A couple of things that you notice about this. First of all, there aren't a lot of holes in this. There are one or two places here, like for example, where there's a couple hundred thousand years where we just don't have any fossils, but those are few and far between. Especially after four million years here, this thing is completely full up. This is really important because I get letters all the time from people who are genuinely convinced that we don't have a single fossil showing human evolution, that it's all just made up. This shows just how much we actually have and the time frames that they actually represent. Another reason this is so important is because you notice this isn't a cladogram. This doesn't show some weird tree where this comes from this comes from that, because that kind of perpetuates this idea that this thing existed and then they all died and then this thing existed and then they all died. That's not how this works at all. Sometimes they split from each other and then they might coexist for a little while. They might even reintegrate later on. Maybe one coexists with the other and then one dies off and another keeps going. These things happen. So here, for example, here's Homo rudolfensis, Homo habilis, and Homo erectus. See how they all exist at the same time for a little while. So this raises some questions. Did Homo erectus come from Homo habilis, and then these guys died off, and these guys continued, and Homo rudolfensis was a totally different thing? Or was Homo rudolfensis and Homo habilis actually the same species with a lot of variability? That's entirely possible. Or did neither of these have anything to do with this guy at all, and they were actually totally separate? That's also possible. It's not what the evidence suggests, but if we find more evidence in here, that could absolutely be the case. So this not only shows what we know, but it allows people to ask really good questions. I love this diagram so much. Man, I need to clean my grout.